Good evening, and welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savagery, with our brother Alok. Namaste. We are continuing with book two, the book of the Traveler of the Worlds. We're on page 222, At the Break. The world of falsehood, the mother of evil, and the sons of darkness. So what we are uh, reading through this canto is particularly the how of the night, not the why. The why comes much later in different sections of the book, but how the night came into being and the mother of evil, how it has come, how it was born, this adversary nature. So this is what we are reading and uh, it starts with, when nothing was save matter without soul and a spiritless hollow was the heart of time. Then life first touched the insensible abyss, awaking this dark void to hope and grief. Her pallid beams smote the unfathomed night, in which God hid himself from his own view. So it starts from that point where matter has already come into existence. Uh, matter is nothing but a condensation and crystallization of the spirit itself. And the inconscient is there, which has given space for the play, the divine play. It's the stage. But when life comes, because matter must now begin to aspire, matter is meant to grow divine. So we have Shubindu's ascending triangle, matter aspires through life, light and love. So the first power that comes is life. Life comes to awaken matter. But what is hid inside matter is the dark abyss. It is right behind and it cries for expression. It says, I too am there. So it's not just a question of emergence of uh, living forms, living beings. But more importantly, the awakening of darkness which is hidden behind. But two things very interesting. One is that Shurabindu says that in this darkness, God is hidden. So that's the great assurance and the promise. The other thing is when life goes to awaken matter, what comes awake through matter is the dark, fathomless night. So it wakes up to life. It becomes living. And Mother speaks of that, that before life and before mind came into existence, the inconscient was not so bad. It was very plastic. You could work upon it. She says, several times I have gone into it. But as life and mind came, it became living. It became more mentalized and that became very difficult. You know, we can take the example of the first machines which mankind made. They were very simple. They, you know, probably the bicycle or clock, things like that. But now, as the machines grow more and more conscious, there is a visible danger. The same machine, you know, <laughs> there is <laughs> the famous book, Rise of the Machines, because when they begin to become conscious, they are conscious in the way of the machine, not in the way of the intelligence which has created them. So it's a phase. So the first thing that comes to life is the darkness which is hidden in matter. And it uses the same energy of matter to build a form for itself. That's what you know, we'll see being described. In all things, she sought their slumbering mystic truth. This about life. She is the life. The unspoken word that inspires unconscious forms. She groped in his deeps for an invisible law. Fumbled in the dim subconscious for his mind and strove to find a way for spirit to be. This is the work for which life has come. We will see it you know, in other cantos also, 
that when life came and entered into matter. So it wants to look for the true law. Life is the power of the divine. So it has entered into matter and is struggling to make the spirit emerge out. So for it to emerge, it must know how the spirit wants to express itself through various forms. So it's looking for the divine law which is concealed. So this is the search of life. And in the process, it plunges into the subconscious. But from the night, another answer came. This becomes the problem. The, now, dark, the darkness. The darkness. Yes. A seed was in that nether matrix cast. A dumb, unprobed husk of perverted truth. A cell of an insentient infinite. Now it's very interesting. Now what is this seed? This seed can come from nowhere except the divine. So these are the four great powers which Mother has spoken of which have plunged into the night. But they become like little tiny seeds surrounded by the husk. It's like the seed which is inside the soil surrounded by the hard layer of the, the crust. And that's the perverted truth. That, yeah, that's the perverted truth. So that will come out first yes. in the process yes. of emergence. It's the same thing we see, I mean, before the beautiful rose blooms, you have the thorns. So that comes. And it serves a purpose, but that will be for later. So it's insentient, but it's infinite. It's truth, but it is perverted. So it just twists truth a little bit, tweaks it. And therefore it changes its entire sense. A monstrous birth prepared its cosmic form in nature's titan embryo, ignorance. Mm. Then in a fatal and stupendous hour, something that sprang from the stark inconscient sleep, unwillingly begotten by the mute void, unwillingly begotten by the mute void, Lifted its ominous head against the stars, overshadowing earth with its huge body of doom. It chilled the heavens with the meanness of a face. So it springs from darkness. So it has a natural tendency to love darkness. It has a natural tendency to oppose light. It has a natural tendency to pull everything back into the darkness. So all the forms that begin to emerge, they emerge under the pressure of this darkness which is right there now behind darkness we have been told God is hidden there but that comes later right now this form comes and claims not only the earth but even the heavens how does it claim the heaven because gods are working here so they are suddenly met with a challenge now there is the sense that as if it was not exactly what should have happened this is the sense here and when mother was asked this question, she says, well, if you see from the other side, then you can call it a play and you can understand and see the purpose. But she says it ought not to have happened. But nevertheless, it has happened. So the question that concerns us now is, what should we do next? So that's a very pragmatic question. It has happened. It shouldn't have happened. Nature should have blossomed under the divine beauty just like you know a flower opens to the sun now Shubindu tells us why this happened ultimately in the highest divine wisdom there was a reason and that also we'll see but uh, well all this pain and suffering did come into existence and yet when mother went down into the unconscious she found a new world yes because it's hidden there yes and there are many reasons why it has come and I am yes. resisting the temptation to speak about it now because <laughs> <laughs> let, let it be the proper time. Right now let's know about this chilling, menacing face, <laughs> shadowy face, which is just the opposite. It's the shadow of the divine. Yeah. So it has all the things, sense of infinity, sense of eternity, the sense of power, even a kind of knowledge which works within it. But it works in a opposite way. A nameless power, a shadowy will arose. Look at this power with a capital P mm. and will with a capital W. Yes. It's, it's just powerful. It's not just, uh, you know, it's just the shadow of that will. It can oppose immense and alien to our universe. 
That's why you will see that as long as there is just the material creation, of course there are tsunamis and there are you know earthquakes, but real perverse creation begin to emerge with life. You know there are plants which will suck in and trap and you know, deception, uh, where they actually suck in it. They they will attract a living creature and then yeah. put it inside and then suddenly they will swallow it. There are plants like that, parasites. Uh, then again you see insects this whole world which has come from which is a distortion and perversion and uh, they have all come into existence but as long as you see just material nature there is still a harmony and beauty which is maintained and that is what mother tells us yes that that harmony is the basis of all basis yes, basis yeah in the inconceivable purpose None can gauge. So here he has used that there is a purpose, but it cannot be conceived by the human mind. One of them is that since the divine is infinite, within the infinity there are all possibilities, including the possibility of opposing and negating itself. So that is one. Why is it allowed? Well, let's have the cat out of the bag because ultimately it ends up enriching the creation. That also we'll see. You know how it does that. A vast non-being robed itself with shape. Now, this non-being again is not the same non-being which is used when Shurabindo uh, refers to the non-being who is above, being and non-being. So, there is the non-being which one meets above. Now, that non-being is uh, the Parabrahman from whom being is immersed. So, that is the non-being. It's it's also called as non-being. But here, the non-being is which denies the being it would not allow anything to come into existence it denies existence it denies everything so in that sense it's a non being and it's the essence of the thing yes and when i asked nalini about these capitals yes he said that's the essence of it yes. so this is a non being with capital n yes. and b yes it is using the same thing so up above if you go beyond sachidanand there is the state of non being yeah. you can't speak of any being there same thing here there is no being so in that sense it's a non being robed itself with shape the boundless nescience of the unconscious depths covered eternity with nothingness again we see the nothingness not the higher shunyam but the nothingness of the inconscient and covered eternity yes a seeking mind replaced the seeing soul life grew into a huge and hungry death the spirit's bliss was changed to cosmic pain so this is how we see that with the entry of life with the entry of mind the straight and sunlit uh, blossoming that changes into something where, where there is lot of struggle where there is lot of pain not the direct blossoming through the soul in fact this is how she experiences when she went into the uh, state of unconsciousness in which people were there sitting around her mm -hmm. and she enters that why they are so unconscious why don't they they want to understand what i am revealing to them and then she entered and that's how she entered into the inconscient through that door and then she experienced that how the mental action action of the mind in the inconscient has made it so rigid so rigid so hard because see the moment mind acts it gives a precise form it it likes to do that then it differentiate this versus that so either an or is born and then it fixes a meaning in the mind it defines things and thereby destroys it limits it at least for sure whereas the divine is infinite so the action of the mind on the inconscient tends to make it very really hard and rigid and that's why she says those who approach it with the mind they have the greatest difficulties and there are those simple people who just approach through the psychic and that's the most beautiful way in fact she says the animals and plant life will open first which at least i am convinced about it because when i go around the ashram i meet a very interesting sight especially at night though i mean you know you will see this sight all the time i see the dogs who are outside are in, in trance yes beautifully but human beings are chattering 
they are sitting outside and talking about all the things going on in the world. So I wonder, you know, <laughs> these dogs are so receptive. They are just all in a state of blissful trance. And each has his place. <laughs> they have forgotten that, in they, yes, yes, place. Yes. And they have forgotten their instincts. And yet they are very sensitive. Yes. They differentiate. The moment they will feel some kind of a sense or presence, they will bark. Otherwise, they are just quiet. <laughs> if I may use the word Satchitananda. <laughs> but human beings are busy chattering about all the things, gossiping <laughs> rather than... <laughs> You know, this wonderful place. So you have this uh, seeking mind. It's about the mind. Assuring God's self-cowled neutrality, a mighty opposition conquered space. So the divine allowed. We read that poem the other day, how divine allows even the Rakshasa to emerge. You know, People often ask this question, why Krishna has to, you know, he could have easily killed Kansa. He did so many miracles as a child. He killed so many Rakshasas. He should have just killed Kansa the moment he was born. But he allowed, he allows him to grow, grow, grow until a point where he collapses by his own weight. But as he collapses, like the velamen of something embryo, then the new thing emerges out of it. So if he would have destroyed Kansa immediately, then where would have been the birth of aspiration? So he allows aspiration to grow. So when the aspiration grows and grows and grows, a time comes when this womb of darkness must burst out. Because that is the right time. As mother puts it in another place, each fruit has its right season. So if you take it out of season, like chick is inside the egg, but you have to allow the time for it to develop. If you do it prematurely, then you don't get a chick, you get just a, you know, omelette. So, <laughs> the divine doesn't want to have an omelette, he wants the chick to emerge. So, that's why, you know, God was neutral and this opposition conquered space. Self-cowled. Self-cowled. Puts, cowl. yeah. Puts a cowl over his yeah. head. <laughs> yes. A sovereign ruling falsehood, death and grief, it pressed its fears hegemony on the earth, disharmonizing the original style of the architecture of our fate's design. It falsified the primal cosmic will and bound to struggle and dread vicissitudes the long, slow process of the patient power. So, that's where the catch took place, that's where the distortion took place. Otherwise, life would have blossomed beautifully. It seems that at one level, you, you sense that it is not the original plan. At another level, you sense that, well, it has been allowed because eventually the result would be far more satisfying. So, this is how it appears that it distorted the original style. What is the original style? You see, in, when there is nothing but matter. Implanting error in the stuff of things, it made an ignorance of the all-wise law. It baffled the sure touch of life's hit sense, kept dumb the intuitive guide in matter's sleep, deformed the insect's instinct and the brute's disfigured man's thought-born humanity. So there are several examples that come here. You see, in nature, in biology, for example, you have these mutations. Now it's a very strange thing, very difficult to understand mutations. You know, uh, most of the time, the, the genetic material and the DNA will go around the fixed pattern. So, you know, you put a seed and the plant will grow. But then there would be some genes which will mutate. Now, most of these mutations are harmful. And nature has a tendency to destroy it or abort. So in a child, if you have, you know, uh, in the womb, if there are mutations uh, which lead to, you know, deformed child, most of the time nature tries to throw it out. This is a natural tendency of nature. But out of million mutations, one mutation will create a genius. So he'll be like an overleaping matter. 
overleaping that species overleap and that's how nature is also evolved if you look at it from another perspective mutation which is like a seeming error has at another level created another kind of balance or creation in you know imagine yes. if there were no errors in human body no errors each cell was replicating yeah. itself perfectly yeah. which it should yes so there would have been no old age and possibly no death once we would have conquered the causes of diseases no genetic error but because there are errors you see that eventually there is old age decline and death even if there were no diseases but they keep a another level the balance of the universe the same death which is born out of that so these errors serve a purpose but they came in they destroyed the you see again she is speaking of insects this also has been very interestingly was yeah. asked to mother i have a lot to say on that too <laughs> please you go yeah first. please uh, because you know what i'm going to say is something very drastic okay <laughs> so, all right <laughs> well this was in the early days of the matrimonial garden yes. so and we would plant beautiful things and every insect in the area knew it was a banquet hmm. yes. and they would wipe out everything yes so i wrote to mother and i asked this question is there a conscious ill will in insects mm. to destroy things and mother wrote back it is not like that insects do good and they do bad um they pollinate fruit and so yeah they i understood can. from that that in nature there's still this yes, balance yes. and mother showed that so same similar question satprem asked in another context so he said you know he was very troubled by the fact that you know things don't move the way they should happen you know there are disturbances mm. human beings and all this you know it, it there is a beautiful garden he gives the example oh, yes. he says that you know if insects come and destroy it so mother said how do you know that that's not going to eventually help so he is totally taken aback he says that you know but they are you know this principle of freedom i wish it was not given because you know they are destroying the whole garden so mother says you go in nature and see so she gave the same example say you may feel like that with a limited consciousness but if you see the gardens in nature eventually it's something very rich yes so yes. then she gave an example that you know when she was a child there was a place which was not kept well at all you know because nobody was caring about the place and it was growing wild so people you know uh, would generally not go there because you know it's it's a very ill kept place and then she say after many years one day there was a little door and she opened as she entered say it was beauty in another way it was wild but but the beauty which was created just by nature through the principle of freedom where insects could destroy you know there is a whole cycle and there is a mm. whole movement yeah. so that's how this uh, you know straight instinct of the insect yeah. here we are just told this part that well uh, they also destroy things which may not have happened but they do it similarly with human beings um, thought born humanity disfigured have one which, more one more thing yes Robert. this is most interesting because it's a flower yes that mother has named inspiration yes it attracts a fly to be pollinated yes so the fly comes in but the hairs are bent this way right. and the fly can't get out oh. so it flies around pollinating like anything <laughs> Three days later the f- the hairs lie down and the fly goes out my god so get it how nature works <laughs> consciousness so inspiration spreads far and wide oh. yeah <laughs> a shadow fell across the simple ray obscured was the truth light in the kevan heart that burns unwitnessed in the altar crypt behind the still velamens secrecy companioning the godhead of the shrine oh. so it's about the psychic and the mind which comes in and intervenes and this mother has spoken of at several places and she says that you know uh, it's true that the coming of man has been like a fall she says the early human being the primitive humanity was different because it still had the straight instincts it could act from the 
fullness of the soul. But later the mind came with all its ifs and buts and uh, good and bad and all kinds of duality. So the straight response was lost. But then she says that eventually, ultimately, when you have crossed the curve and you go to the next level, ascend beyond the mind, then of course, it's a far, far more powerful and rich creation. Those who have the faith, who have gone beyond the you know, rational mind, who have their developed intellect and a rational mind, and yet are burning with faith. That's a much greater thing. But then in the middle, there is a passage which is truly like a fall. And she gives several examples of, you know, uh, I mean, constructions, architecture, all that human beings have created, and, uh, you know, uh, the selfies and what not. <laughs> so, <laughs> not to speak the least, you know, I keep seeing and I say, what is this, you know, with yeah. motorcycles, suddenly somebody stands on the road with pictures. I mean, you're hardly enjoying the joy and beauty of nature, even going around the ocean. It's so inspiring. But we lose all that. It's like mind makes us narrow and shut inside a small shell. And yet mankind has to go through this passage. Thus was the dire antagonistic, thus was the dire antagonist energy born, who mimes the eternal mother's mighty shape and mocks a luminous infinity with a grey distorted silhouette in the night. Mm. So she comes to imitate. <coughs> Arresting the passion of the climbing soul, she forced on life a slow and faltering pace. See, if human beings could directly leap with faith in the divine, but they don't. They start, you know, becoming every step they take, they start questioning, thinking, what will happen, what will be the consequences. At one place he says that, you know, that's one of the big difficulties. He says, when you come to yoga, you should be willing to take a leap. Yeah. And then don't worry because, you know, you, you may fall your head. <laughs> you know, she says all that. <laughs> you may fall on your head. Doesn't matter, you take a leap. So the disciple asks a very pragmatic question. He says, Mother, but with the ocean, you can actually see the ocean. Because he, he, he gives the example of the ocean. Yes. He says, yes, of course, my child, you must have at least some idea of the divine. So by seeing, he says, yes, I am not saying that just blindly jump. But some idea of the divine. But once you have it, then take, take the leap. But the mind would not allow, the life instincts would not allow, the sense of self-preservation would not allow. She even says, without worrying about hitting the rocks yes, on the that's, bottom. Yes, that's what. Yeah, that's that's what. The one. And she says, there comes a time when you have to hang only with faith. Yeah. Nothing what else. Was the, that one year we had, blessed are those who, who take, take a, a leap, leap into towards the future. the future. Yes, yes. Her hands deflecting and retarding weight is laid on the mystic evolution's curve. But again, you see, it's something very interesting that as it deflects, it ends up making the design or God's doodle, which this world is, even more intricate. That's one way. You know, like when ink had spilt over a child's frock and the child went to the mother, uh, not the frock, on, on uh, something she was carrying, I think some card or something. So this child was crying. And mother asked, why are you crying? Oh, ink has spilled. She said, come, let us see. So, you know, the ink was still fresh. So she started, you know, using her finger to make a pattern out of it. And the, at the end of it, she made such a beautiful pattern out of the spilt ink that the child began smiling. So it reminds us of the creation where there are deviations, there are deflections, but the divine turns everything into a more enriching experience and the creation becomes very vast and complex. So in one sense, it brings the infinity which is within. And But the difficulty, the more in, uh, you know um, complex it becomes, the more difficulty in harmonizing it. This is the problem which, uh, you know, mother faced even in the ashram. She said every time a new person comes, uh, it means new possibilities as well as new difficulties. Yes. And yet she would take it now with the rest of it to integrate and harmonize. It's not easy because it, it's a totally new thing. The tortuous line of a deceiving mind, the gods see not and man is important, oppressing the god spark within the soul, she forces back to the beast the human fall. Why? Because something is not ready. There is the beast hidden inside. It draws out the beast and forces to the beast the human fall. Yeah. And several times, several approximations 
until we cross that line. Yet in her formidable instinctive mind, she feels the one grow in the heart of time and sees the immortal shine through the human mold. So through all this process, some work is done and this darkness slowly gets transmuted more and more into shades of grey towards the light. Now comes the practical part. That why all this is important? Why should we know all this? Because those who are turned to yoga, especially those who have love for mother, mother has spoken of it. The other day we were reading also what Pranabda says. Yes. They are the ones mostly who become the target of the adverse forces. They attack them most. Because others are anyways under their reign. And I give this example of Vibhishna in Ravana's court. Uh, Ravana was uh, making you know, gold houses for everybody. But to Vibhishna, he gave a kick. When he gave a kick, when he says, Rama is the Lord. Same thing we see with Prahlad and Hiranyakashipu. So all these stories are essentially that as long as you are conforming to the ways of darkness, they don't mind. When uh, Bharati Di went to Velour Hospital and mother said, you know, she doesn't like the atmosphere of hospitals. So... The disciple says, but she is quite comfortable there. She says, yes, some people are in harmony with that atmosphere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> because she was a nurse or something mm -hmm. like that before, she says, some people are in harmony with that atmosphere. Yeah. They are quite comfortable there. And then she speaks about it, you know, how um, these forces are ever on the watch uh, when we are growing and how they can pull us. Uh, these adverse forces. But as you say, they they want the more evolved, the yes, more, the yes, more they catch them. Yes. So here comes, alarmed for her rule and full of fear and rage, she prowls around each light that gleams through the dark, casting its ray from the spirit's lonely tent, hoping to enter with fierce, stealthy tread, and in the cradle. Slay the divine child. Oh. So we grew up with this story, but we didn't know what it means. Uh, when Krishna is born, uh, one of the first uh, danger he faces is from Putna. Putna is, uh, assumes the form of Krishna's mother and is sent by Kansa to slay Krishna. And he comes as a mother who would feed the baby. And she feeds the baby with poison tainted breasts. So it's a very symbolic story, you know. She comes to slay the divine child in the cradle. But the child ends up growing stronger and destroys Putna because Krishna is the symbol of uh, the psychic being. Mother has spoken of that. But they attempt because the moment they see a little light growing, that's when they attack the aspirant. Incalculable are her strength and ruse. Her touch is a fascination and a death. She kills her victim with his own delight. Even good she makes a hook to drag to hell. So we have spoken of this, how karna, the sense of goodness, generosity, uh, fidelity to a friend, which are very high qualities. Uh, she made a hook to drag him to the precipice and the hell. Yeah. So they can use even good, you know, uh, trying to help. So many letters of Mother and Shubindo where... Uh, the disciple says, uh, so and so wants my help, should I give? So some places Shubindu would say, all right, help means in things like, you know, uh, wants to learn English or something. Some places he would say yes, other places he would say no. Because he saw this help is one of the ways that one will get hooked and will be dragged. So I'm not going into the details of the stories, but there are plenty of them. For her, the world runs to its agony. And look at this, that, you know, she kills the victim with his own delight. You see, drugs, yeah. Yeah. pleasure, yeah. it drags us to the precipice and we don't realize that how it is finishing us from within. I mean, those who are conscious do realize, but otherwise. Often the pilgrim on the eternal's road, illit from clouds by the pale moon of mind, or in devious byways wandering alone, or lost in deserts where no path is seen, falls overpowered by her lion leap, a conquered captive 
under her dreadful paws. So this again, there is the Sphinx which guards the gates of eternity, the Divine Sphinx. And there is its counterpart, the Nether Sphinx, who guards the pathways to hell, to darkness. And she waits for the pilgrim on the road and how she overpowers and leaps that we are seeing here. Now, here Shubhendra is indicating what is the safety. Those who try to practice yoga only from the mind, who do not allow the psychic emergence and who want to just do it all by themselves, devious ways, trying, experimenting this, experimenting that, this is the real danger. That's why the need of master, fidelity to the master and to bring out the psychic as soon as possible, they become really, they keep us safe. Otherwise, it's so easy to be dragged away. And dragged away far. Yes. Though it's different that the divine never leaves. See what happened to Dilip Kumar Roy and you know, after all this love. Yeah. And imagine of all the people, Krishna Prem, who had this capacity, he tells him, yes, you feel that, you know, I, Indra Devi, she is the one uh, who has come to help you in the process and yes, you must, he, he didn't uh, stop him. Mm. And he went with her. Yeah. Much later he regretted, he understood. And he would start inquiring about mother and he would say, I, I know she is you know, full of compassion. Mm. And when he went for the relics installation in Mumbai as well as in Kolkata, he was asked to speak. He was such an erudite person. And he just couldn't speak a word but cried, just saying, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Knowing, you know, which way things have turned. So it is so important and because he was so close. Yes. And so, you know, one has to pass through all these things. And then particularly through the sexual uh, door, which is the most dangerous of all. Intoxicated by a burning breath and amorous groan of a destroying mouth. Once a companion of the sacred fire, the mortal perishes to God and light. An adversary governs heart and brain in nature, hostile to the mother force. So here we must know the difference between love and sexual relationship. But also with the caveat that it's so easy for emotional love to degrade into passion and still lower down. Because they are so closely connected, even in the human biology and in the evolutionary process. And that can be really fatal. So, Shurabindo uh, cautions us and to what extent that the mortal can perish to God and light once a you know, companion of the sacred fire. Such is the danger. The self of life yields up its instruments to titan and demonic agencies that aggrandize earth, nature and this frame. A cowled fifth columnist is now thought's guide. His subtle defeatist murmur slays the faith. See this fifth columnist is in battle. You have the last, those who are not fighters. They are full of fear. So they are hiding behind and their task is to, you know, just the supplies etc. Basically spies too. Yeah, yeah. Now they become the guide. Yeah. They are not warriors, so they are full of doubts, full of fears, full of suspicion. And, and here I have seen people, you know. Classic example is uh, one person who is, whom mother had even given the blessing packet, Superman. And he had such fantastic opening. And uh, mother had only told him about one thing. That don't get into sexual relationship with a woman. And till date he laments, he says, I just couldn't follow that advice and after that his mind and I mean till date he keeps on uh, experiencing these hostile suggestions and voices but because mother's touch is there he knows they are hostile attacks every morning he will say the hostile force was telling me this but I am not listening to it I said very good don't listen to it and such a restless person but in Savitri session he will come and sit and become suddenly quiet and after that he'll go. Such is the magic of Savitri. A person who just cannot concentrate on anything but half an hour Savitri session he will come, sit quietly, all his restlessness will cease and then again the moment it's over, after a few minutes he'll tell me that you know again I got that suggestion from the hostiles 
and I'm not going to listen. Isn't it all right? I said, yes, very good. <laughs> I've kept telling him that don't talk about these forces, talk about mother, think of mother. He says, yes, thank you. But ah, that's it. So, you know, it's, it's a real danger. And lost in the breast or whispering from outside, a lying inspiration fell and dark, a new order substitutes for the divine. We'll quickly read these lines so that we finish. A silence falls upon the spirit's heights. From the veiled sanctuary, the God retires. Empty and cold is the chamber of the bride. The golden nimbus now is seen no more. Sometimes the psychic being can leave such people. And uh, heart becomes cold, incapable of love, yeah. incapable of warmth. And, you know, it retires because psychic being is different. But the rest of the being, the frame remains. No longer burns the white spiritual ray and hushed forever is the secret voice. Then by the angel of the vigil tower, a name is struck from the recording book. A flame that sang in heaven sings Quenched and mute. Look at the word quenched. Yeah. And yeah. it's mute because it precipitous fall. Yeah. And the gods had written the names, ah, he is one of us. And suddenly Str the gods say, No, Str strike, no more. Strike the name. The name is struck. In ruin ends the epic of his soul. This is the tragedy of the inner death when forfeited is the divine element. And only a mind and body live to die. So it's so important, Mother says, you must guard your faith and aspiration as the most precious thing, you know, most invaluable treasure. Because anything that attacks it, and I've seen people who have, you know, been carried away and in a moment of darkness. So these are the dangers. And yet, of course, there is a purpose and reason, but that's a different story altogether. Right now, it's a word of caution, the need for vigilance against these forces, which prowl especially against those who are pilgrims of the light. These are the inner terrorists, terrorists of inner life, who are waiting for the least guarded, or rather least unguarded, unguarded moment yes. to attack and finish. Yes need for vigilance.